Hi, so I'm uh, Chris Jiggins, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, butterflies that we study. Uh, so these are Heliconius butterflies, so here's a Heliconius errato. Uh, you can see they're very brightly coloured, and they're famous for their bright warning colours, which actually warn predators um, that they're bad to eat. And so they have an enormous diversity of wing patterns, and we've spent a lot of uh, time over the years studying the diversity of these wing patterns and the genetic basis of, the, of those. And so we know a lot about, uh, about how they evolve new wing patterns and also how mimicry evolves. So they also evolve to uh, converge uh, and share wing patterns, which, which helps to teach predators um, more readily that they're, that they're bad to eat. So these bright color patterns they have on their wings are a, a, an advertising strategy, basically, to tell the predators that these um, butterflies should be avoided. Now more recently, um, Erica Castro, who's a Brazilian postdoc in my group, has been working on the um, way in which these butterflies interact with their host plants. So they have a, a fantastic sort of co-evolution with passiflora, so they, they, the caterpillars can only eat the leaves of uh, passiflora plants, so this is the passion vines that we know from passion fruits, so they're useful species for us. But they're also extraordinarily diverse. So there's about five or 600 species of Passiflora found around the world, but the greatest diversity is in South America, um, where these butterflies are also found. Now, um, the um, Passifloras have a huge diversity of leaf shapes. So I'm gonna show you a few here. This is sort of standard leaf there. It's a kind of a, almost like a butterfly shaped one. Um, and then, uh, Kind of a three lobed one here, and I've got a five lobed one here. So, oh, here we go. Five lobes, there we go. So, there's enormous diversity of, uh, of leaf shapes among the passifloras, and that's thought to be partly an adaptation to avoid being attacked by the butterflies. So, the butterflies learn to find the plants with the shape of the leaves, uh, and the more diversity of leaves you, you have, the more difficult it is for the butterflies to, to find their host plants. A few other things that the plants do. so. Um, some of them have trichomes, so this is a pas one called Passiflora adenopoda. It has tiny little uh, hooks, hooked heads, which are called trichomes, that prevent the caterpillars from eating it. And you can tell this species because it sticks to your shirt a bit like Velcro. So it's got tiny little hooks just like a piece of Velcro, and that prevents the caterpillars from eating it. There are some species that produce um, extra floral nectaries, so these are little glands that produce nectar that attract ants, and that stops the the ants uh, eat the eggs and the caterpillars of the butterflies, so that's a good strategy. Uh, and there are other species that have um, structures that look like butterfly eggs, so they have bright yellow structures. And when the, cat when the butterfly comes along, it thinks, oh, there's eggs here already, I won't lay my eggs on this, on this leaf. And so that also helps to deter the, the, the predation. Um, but perhaps more important than that is an enormous diversity of chemical defenses that these, these plants have. So different plant species have different composition of chemicals, uh, and those chemicals deter or even prevent the butterflies from um, feeding on them. The butterflies and the plants has been in this chemical arms race for a very long time. And so the plants produce like many defense compounds that keeps most of the herbivores away, but not heliconinis because they can actually utilize the chemical defenses of the plants in their own defense. But the plants are also very smart, so they evolve to modify the compounds that the butterflies cannot use. But the butterflies are also very smart, and they can produce, they, buy, they can biosynthesize the compounds themselves. So if the plant that don't have the compounds that, can, uh, that they can get it's available, they can go to another passiflora plant uh, and then they will just biosynthesize uh, these defenses instead of getting from the, the plants themselves. So they balance these two processes uh, between producing the compounds themselves and getting the plant compounds. Erica's work is exciting because it's a form of plasticity. In other words, uh, when the butterfly feeds on one plant, it generates the toxins itself, and it feeds on a different plant, it can use the toxins from um, the plant. So it's sort of, depending on the ecological circumstance, uh, the butterfly can adapt its, its, its ecological strategy. 
So plasticity is uh, very important generally for organisms. It basically refers to the way that um, a single genotype, in other words, uh, genetically identical organisms, can respond differently to different environmental cues. So that could be in their behavior, uh, or in this case, in their biochemical responses to different host plants. And so plasticity is very important in evolution. It can allow organisms to colonize new, new niches. And um, we can think about in the, in the butterflies, it allows them to, for example, colonize new host plants and expand the range of plants that they can use. But it could also be important, for example, in organisms adapting to climate change um, by responding to differing environmental cues and altering their responses to those cues. So understanding plasticity is important, both for understanding evolution and the diversity of life, but also thinking about how organ organisms will respond to a changing climate.